I am so pleased to have on the line with us Professor Michael Mann. Dr. Michael Mann is the Distinguished Professor of Meteorology and the Director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's author of Dire Predictions, his most recent book, Understanding Climate Change, and previously The Hockey, Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. His website is michaelmann.net. And Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks, Tom. Always good to be with you. Thanks for ha- thanks for joining us. Uh, we talked about this on on TV a week or so ago. I, I, I wanted to to dig into it a little bit on the radio with a somewhat different audience. Yeah. Um, the the great conveyor belt. The this this idea that uh, or not this idea this this reality that the ocean is already reassigning recirculating heat uh, to different land masses and that that. Uh, process may change in our lifetime. Um, can you can you tell us about that? Sure thing. So there is this ocean current. Sometimes we refer to it as the Gulf Stream, but the Gulf Stream is just this piece of it off the east coast of the U.S. It's part of a larger ocean current that continues on into the higher latitudes of the North Atlantic. Uh, this current, this warm current, heads up uh, towards uh, Greenland. It eventually sinks in the North Atlantic, and it is pr- uh, part of a sort of global ocean circulation pattern that helps transport heat into the higher latitudes of the North Atlantic. It keeps the North Atlantic, parts of Europe, parts of uh, eastern North America and Canada warmer than they otherwise would be. Uh, We know this ocean circulation pattern actually collapsed uh, one time in in the past, about 12,000 years ago at the end of the Ice Age when all of this uh, melted ice flowed into the North Atlantic as fresh water. It inhibited the sinking motion that drives this current system, and the North Atlantic and surrounding regions temporarily went into uh, a uh, ice age-like state uh, for roughly another thousand years until we finally came out of the ice age. So we don't have nearly as much ice around now as we did then. We don't expect nearly as large of uh, an effect now. But because of the melting of ice from global warming, we do suspect that this ocean circulation pattern uh, not only could slow down. There is evidence now, and my colleagues and I published an article earlier this year showing that it's already happening, and it's happening faster than the models predicted it to. Which is bad news, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah. You know, so yeah. Well, there us. are a number of things that you know that this would cause. Well, one of them, uh, interestingly enough, is faster sea level rise along the east coast of the U.S. If this ocean circulation pattern slows down, then because of the relationship between ocean circulation and the surface of the ocean, it would actually cause sea level to rise even faster along the east coast of the U.S., which is obviously a problem because we're already facing the the, the fairly uh, serious impacts of sea level rise now. Are we talking two or three inches over 50 years, or are we talking two or three feet over the next decade, or what? Well, we're talking a a few extra inches potentially from this effect, but that's on top of what may well be feet, feet of sea level rise if we continue with business as usual, fossil fuel burning and continued warming of the planet. Wow. Wow. So, uh, you know, we, I'm guessing a lot of people have seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, uh, where this scenario happens and instantly North America and Europe are plunged into an ice age. Um, obviously that's, uh, something that would happen over what period of time if this were to, does it even happen that way? I mean, you know, what, what can we expect? Or is, is, I mean, is it going to be a new ice age or is it going to be just like, you know, massive crop failures in North America and Europe, that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, you know, right now my uh, first year class that I teach on climate change, we're watching the movie the day after tomorrow in class, we're going to finish it tomorrow. Hmm. And we watch the movie and we sort of pick it apart and we have fun and we eat some popcorn and we try to learn some science and distinguish Uh, fiction from reality. And most of the movie is indeed fiction. Much of what plays out in the movie uh, is unrealistic. We're not going to get giant hurricanes covering the northern hemisphere. We're not going to get a massive growth of an ice sheet within a matter of days. We're not going to get tornadoes destroying uh, Los Angeles and the Hollywood sign. Uh, But what we might get, and not over days, but potentially over decades, is this slowing of this key ocean current system, it could mean um, actually, ironically, uh, cool and sort of clammy uh, summers for regions like Newfoundland, uh, eastern Canada. It could mean more sea level rise along the U.S. East Coast, as we were talking about before. And uh, it could actually mean a collapse of this key 
uh, ocean circulation system that provides nutrients in the North Atlantic, which makes that region so product uh, productive from an, a biological standpoint, from a fisheries standpoint. So it could threaten, uh, you know, our, our ability to continue to, um, you know, be have productive fisheries in the North Atlantic, a key region, and obviously uh, it's, that's a problem at a time when climate change is already uh, making, uh, you know, hurting our uh, food resources, making food resources more scarce for a global, uh, a growing global population. Right. You're the author of a book, uh, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. Where are we at in the climate wars? Well, you know, I, I, you probably followed this story. Over the last couple of weeks, it's come out that um, you know, the largest fossil fuel company in the world, ExxonMobil, they knew in the 1970s, in their internal documents, we now know that they had determined that global warming was real, that it was caused by burning of fossil fuels. They said the impacts could be catastrophic. Those were their own internal scientists, and that's all come out. There was a front page article in, in the LA Times just yesterday about this. Um, and what did they choose to do, and what did many of the other fossil fuel interests choose to do? Well, they, they did the same thing that the tobacco industry did when faced with the fact that their product was actually killing people. Uh, they chose to hide the evidence. They chose to fund a massive misinformation campaign to confuse the public and, and policymakers. I think people are now seeing that. There's, you know, this is coming to light. The veil has been lifted on sort of the industry-funded climate change denial machine, and people are seeing the impacts of climate change play out in front of them. Um, we, we can see it's happening. We can feel that it's happening now where we live. Yeah. So we might be where the uh, tobacco industry was at. I mean, they, they went from being literally the most powerful lobby here in Washington, D.C., to one of the least powerful lobbies over about a three-year period as a result of losing a RICO lawsuit, uh, which I think ran from 99 to 2006, as I recall. I could be wrong. Um, and that was the federal government saying, by funding the science that denies addiction and cancer from tobacco, your industry is engaged in, in uh, racketeering and uh, racketeering influenced organized corruption. I mean, you, know, they, they, you have violated the RICO Act. And there have been calls for the RICO Act to be invoked against the ExxonMobil and uh, some of these other big uh, fossil fuel giants, presumably Coke Industries and whatnot, for basically the same thing. D do you think that there's any possibility of that? I mean, I, I don't think anybody thought it could happen against the tobacco industry in, say, 1995, but it certainly did. <clears throat> That's right. And we now know that they were using exactly the same playbook. The fossil fuel interests were using the very same playbook that the tobacco industry had used. In some cases, and the same scientists. Many of the same scientists who were advocates for, you know, for, for tobacco are, are now advocates attacking the science of climate change. Um, and uh, Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island has actually made that very argument that based on what we now know, uh, based on the information that's come to light, uh, perhaps we need to be looking at anti-racketeering um, you know, uh, a suit, uh, a RICO suit uh, brought against uh, fossil fuel interests that knowingly hid the negative impacts of their product from the public. Yeah, that would be a remarkable event. I mean, it would just be an absolutely remarkable event. We're going to get uh, Sheldon Whitehouse on the program here. Um, oh, we got we have 10 seconds until the end of this. So okay. are you in general optimistic, sir? I am. There are a lot of great things happening uh, right now. You know, we, we've grown the global economy this year without uh, any growth in carbon emissions. For the first time ever, we added more renewable energy capacity this year than fossil fuel energy capacity worldwide. So we're turning the corner. We just have to put the, the, the fo our foots on uh, our feet on the accelerator pedal um, I'm with and you. speed that up. I'm with you, Michael Mann. Uh, the website Michael Mann M A N N dot net. Uh, Professor Mann is also the author most recently of Dire Predictions and The Hockey Stick in the Climate Wars. Professor Mann, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Tom. Always a pleasure.